Hello, uh, Earth Introduction to Earth Science, um, Monday and Wednesday classes. Uh, because Monday of this week is Labor Day, we are, I'm recording a short lecture um, that I will post on Blackboard, which is obviously where you're watching this, and uh, then we will have lab on Wednesday. So this week we will be looking at the uh, light, the sun, and looking at galaxies. So this is looking at chapter 23 and 24. And remember, exam one is going to be next week. So make sure you're uh, looking for the study guides, which will be posted once I write the exam, as well as uh, looking back over your homeworks and quizzes. So the universe. Um, the last thing the textbook is actually covering is the universe and how it formed and its possible fate. I think it's something that needs to be covered earlier on, so we're covering it now. Cosmology is the study of the universe. It's looking at how the universe works. So we've already learned that the universe started with the Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago. Once the universe had cooled enough, um, subatomic particles will combine to form the first elements, which were hydrogen and then helium. So we started off with hydrogen, then we got helium, and then everything comes from that. Gravity condenses all of that gas down into clumps and stars and galaxies. So for the first stars were forming 200 million years after the Big Bang. These were primarily hydrogen. They were very, very massive and they had very short lifespans, talking in the realm of the universe's age. Um, and they would die explosively. And the, the deaths of those stars led to additional elements being formed. So those early stars' deaths um, basically became factories for new stars, and they generated more elements to make the universe more vast. The universe is expanding. So evidence shows that all the galaxies outside our local cluster are moving away from us. So this tells us that the universe is constantly expanding. The further away a galaxy is, the uh, faster it moves away. So that's actually Hubble's law, that galaxies will recede at a speed that's proportional to their distance from the observer. So the further away they are, the further they will get. Um, we talk about this as the raisin bread dough analogy. So basically you have a lump of dough with raisins in it. As that dough is rising, the raisins will move away from each other proportionally. Um, so the entire thing's getting bigger and all the raisins are moving away from each other. It's the same idea with galaxies and the universe. The expansion of the universe um, should actually produce cosmic microwave background radiation. So basically energy is constantly being produced. This was found in 1965. So this confirmed that the universe is constantly expanding. So the universe is constantly expanding. What does that mean for the future of the universe? Um, can it continue to do so? So there are two big ideas that your book covers. There are some other ones out there as well. One of them is called the big chill. So the big chill is the idea that the universe um, will keep expanding until the stars will burn out and there will be no energy left. So that it basically is a heat death, that it just dies, that there's no energy left. Uh, the other one's called the big crunch. So this is the idea that the expansion is gonna slow down and cease and eventually gravity will pull everything together into a crunch so everything gets smaller. Uh, density is gonna determine and whether, which of these is true. So um, if it's greater than the critical density, gravity should prevent continued outward expansion. So if gravity is strong enough, it should keep things, eventually stop things from expanding outward. Um, but if it's not strong enough, or if it, we don't hit that critical density, then gravity can't prevent the outward expansion. Adding into it, there are two additional um, parts of the universe. We have what's called dark matter. So this is the missing matter that explains why we observe that all stars orbit galaxy centers at a similar speed. So we would expect that the stars would potentially orbit based on their their mass, that it wouldn't that they wouldn't all be orbiting at the same at a similar speed. But something is speeding up certain stars and slowing down others, and we call that dark matter. So there's something we can't see that is controlling the orbital speeds of stars. The other one is called dark energy. So gravity should be slowing down expansion, but we don't see that happening. We see expansion happening. So this means something is speeding up the expansion of the universe, and that's called dark energy. And so dark matter would imply um, the idea of the big crunch, 
dark energy would support the idea of the big chill and current um, theories are or the current uh, train of thought is that dark energy is a prevailing force so that the big chill is the more likely fate but we may learn more as we learn more about the universe so how do we actually observe space and know about the universe well we mostly use telescopes telescopes have been around for a long time uh, the early ones are all what are known as optical telescopes so this is a vision telescope and the very early ones were what are called refracting telescopes these will bend light to focus so it's a similar idea to eyeglasses um, so that's what we see on this image at the top that the light comes in through a lens and that lens focuses the light near to your eye and so you're able to see things from far away the better telescopes now are what are called reflecting telescopes so instead of bending the light it bounces the light off mirrors and that's how we focus it um, we're able to get much better magnification with smaller instruments using reflecting telescopes we also now have the technology to use what's either called adapt active or adaptive optics um, this is where we in those reflecting telescopes we can actually change the mirror shape to remove any sources of noise and to account for things like the atmosphere um, and other things that may be distorting our image so basically we can have small little pistons that actually change the shape of the mirror um, so you can kind of think of that as we're we're fine tune we're using a tuning dial <laughs> if you even know what that is um, to uh, improve the, the focus of the image there are also radio telescopes so this is where we're listening for energy that's outside visible spectrum um, so we're looking for wavelengths in the EM spectrum which we will talk about in a second that are not visible um, these are mostly earth-based because they need to be very large so we're looking at uh, long wavelengths at this point and um, you know listening for energy so we see that in this red bit these are the radio telescopes um, we can also have space-based telescopes so these um, remove any impact from the atmosphere because anything that we're observing with a earth-based instrument it's coming through our atmosphere which will distort it um, and we lose a lot of information in that if we take the telescope up to space we eliminate that problem um, and we also eliminate the sun interference so any you know the sun's the brightest thing near us and it actually blocks out a lot of the energy that we would um, be interested in space-based telescopes are challenging though because you're taking up in space there's limits on what we can put up into space um, many telescopes are placed on mountains so we are looking for the clear sky possible so if we can raise the elevation of the telescope that that improves it another way that we improve telescopes is as an array so basically you use multiple instruments and they combine they combine to act similar to one really big instrument because building these very large mirrors can be challenging so if you have several smaller mirrors that work together it has the impact of one large mirror so telescopes are looking at the electromagnetic radiation spectrum the EM spectrum uh, this goes from short wavelengths which are high frequency so these are the gamma rays and the x-rays um, then we go into what's called ultraviolet light you may have heard that term and then we go into the visible light which is a very small part of the spectrum this is what we can actually see which is Roy G Biv and then we go into infrared light and then up to radio waves so radio waves are long wavelengths low energy uh, gamma waves are short wavelength high energy so wavelength is the distance between two peaks um, or two crests or two troughs on the wavelength that we see up here so the farther apart they are the longer the wavelength frequency is the amount of time it takes to get for this peak to reach to the place of that peak so for shorter wavelengths that's lower time so they're higher energy for longer wavelengths it takes a longer time um, 
We can also think about waves as being particles. So photons are a particle of light and they exert radiation pressure. So we learned about that when we were looking at comets and uh, how the tail moves. We also talk about a spectra. So this is looking at the energy across the board for the different wavelengths. We could talk about continuous spectra. This is the um, when you take a prism and you see the rainbow. We're getting keeping all the energy. We also talk about emission spectra. So emission spectra is where we only see certain colors, only see certain wavelengths coming through. This is very useful when we're trying to identify uh, materials. The opposite of emission is absorption. So this is where we don't see certain um, wave or energy sources coming through. So instead of, we see the full spectra minus lines. So we have um, absorption lines. And again, this is useful for identifying specific materials. So each element has a specific um, absorption uh, spectra. So we can, if we see the absorption spectra for water, we know that that is present in um, our source. So light tells us a lot. Um, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second in a vacuum. Um, what we're seeing is the stars from the past. So we learned about light years in lab. So it takes, uh, it takes, I don't remember off the top of my head, um, how far light travels in a year. Um, six trillion miles, I believe, was the uh, number, or 9.6 trillion kilometers in a year. That's a pretty long distance, um, and most of our stars are pretty far away. So we're seeing potentially at times dead stars, that they've already died and the light is still making its way to us. So we're seeing a snapshot of the past when we look at the stars. The light coming in can also tell us the composition. So all materials have distinct frequencies. So we can tell what these stars are made of. We can tell the temperature. Oh, sorry, let me go back to the composition. So this uh, spectra up here, this is an absorption spectra and we can see the lines for different elements. So for example, sodium, hydrogen, uh, iron, actually hydrogen has several um, lines or um, uh, absorption lines. And if we see those absorption lines at those frequencies, we know that that element is present. So this helps us determine the chemical composition of distant objects. Uh, temperature can be told by light. So the hotter an object is, it um, it's gonna radiate more energy per unit than a colder object. Hotter objects tend to be blue, colder objects are red. We can also tell what direction an object is moving. If an object is moving away from us, we will have what's called a red shift, which means that the spectra will move towards the red part of the spectrum. So we'll move towards longer wavelengths. If we have the opposite happening, that means the object's moving closer to us. So if the spectrum moves towards the blue side, that means that we have a um, object that's moving closer to us. If it's moving towards the, I'm sorry, I said that first one wrong. Redshift is moving towards longer wavelengths. Blue shift is moving towards shorter wavelengths. So most of our light comes from the sun, our star. It's a middle of the range star where you're gonna look at stars in a little bit. Um, it, like all of the other bodies in our, or all of the large bodies in our solar system has layers. So there's a core to the sun. Outside the core is the radiation zone. Then we have a convection zone. So we have particles moving within the sun. The photosphere is what we actually see. It's the visible surface. It's about 500 kilometers thick and it's not smooth. It's actually granules. So don't look directly at the sun, but when we get images from space of the sun, we see that it's not a smooth surface. There's the chromosphere, um, which is outside the photosphere. It's a few thousand kilometers thick, so it's a very thick um, part of the sun. Actually, it's not that thick because the sun is very, <laughs> very big. So it's basically the crust of the sun. And then we have the corona, which is the um, halo around the sun. So the sun is quite active. Um, we get our, all of our energy comes from the sun. It's actually all derived from the sun. 
the energy of the sun is due to nuclear fusion. So we have proton-proton reactions where we take four hydrogen, and those will turn into one helium plus energy. So we have four hydrogen nuclei, which are protons. We go through fusion, and then we end up getting one helium, which has two protons and two neutrons. So two of the protons from hydrogen become neutrons in the helium, but there's some leftover energy there. Um, using Einstein's E equals MC squared, where E is energy, M is maths, um, and C is the, uh, I believe C is the speed of light in there. Let me check on that for a second. And I'm back, yes, C and E equals MC squared is the speed of light. Uh, so the mass of helium is only 99.3%, the mass of the four hydrogens that went into it. So that means that for 600 million tons of hydrogen, um, which is how much hydrogen is converted into helium every second, that 600 million tons becomes only 596 million tons of helium. So there are 4 million tons of matter that's converted to energy every second coming out of the sun. And again, our sun is fairly middle road. It's a massive amount of energy. The sun has some other interesting features. We, um, it's not as if you, you know, most images of the sun from Earth, um, unless you have a very good telescope, will look fairly uniform. It's not. There are dark blotches. Um, often these occur in pairs that are surrounded by smaller sunspots. Um, so these dark blotches are the sunspots. Sorry about that. The center is the umbra, and there's a lighter region outside that is the penumbra. So it almost looks like an eyeball. Um, these are actually only dark in contrast to the rest of the sun. So these are extremely bright, but the rest of the sun is so bright that these appear dark. They are governed by the magnetic field of the sun. So the magnetic field actually will connect two pairs of sunspots. Um, and the magnetic field there is extremely strong. It's a thousand times stronger in the sunspot than the surrounding areas. And the sunspots appear darker because they are cooler because that magnetic field is disrupting the convective flow beneath the sunspots. Um, and actually, we can see in this bottom image how when we have high amounts of sunspot activity, the magnetic field of the sun is very convoluted and complex. We also can have um, prominences, which are where we have chromospheric gases in a cloud-like structure. So if they're quiescent, that means they're hanging motionless. Um, if they're eruptive, they explode away from the sun. So those are the ones that are more uh, interesting to look at. Coronal mass ejection is when we have one of those eruptive prominences um, or another storm that completely leaves the sun. So it's no longer attached to the sun. A solar flare is an outburst of brightening above a sunspot cluster. So we suddenly get a bright spot above a cluster. On the Earth, uh, we will see auroras at the uh, North Pole and the South Pole. So this is a glow in the upper atmosphere that is due to a coronal mass ejection that's interacting with our atmosphere. They are rather impressive to see. So that was about our sun, which again is middle of the road. So our sun is over here. There are different ways to classify stars. Um, we look at what's known as luminosity. So this is the brightness of the star. Luminosity is the absolute magnitude of the star. We also look at apparent magnitude. So apparent magnitude is how bright the star appears from Earth. And if you have lower or negative values, those are brighter stars. So we have the apparent magnitude, which is from Earth, but then we can also talk about the absolute magnitude, which is the luminosity. And this is how it bright it really is. And again, lower values are brighter. We um, determine the magnet or the brightness at a standard distance of 32.6 light years. So we're basically setting all of them to the same standard, and that's why it's an absolute magnitude. We also classify based on color. So this is a uh, proxy for temperature. So the blue stars are hotter, red or colder. Um, so we see that on this graph that we go from the hot stars to the cooler stars. And we also talk about size. So we have supergiants, which are the very, very large. And then we have giants, which are large. We have the mainline sequence, which are the average stars. The sun is one of those. And these will um, progress 
through a sequence, which is why they're called the main sequence. I'm sorry, I keep calling it main line. Um, <laughs> it's just main sequence. And then we have dwarfs, which are tiny stars, and they also progress through a sequence. This chart, we are looking at the luminosity on one side the, the values are for luminosity on one side, and then absolute magnitude are the values on the other side. So these, again, are the same thing, just on different scales. Um, so the brighter ones are negative. So the white stars are going to be the brighter stars, and they're negative here. Um, the Luminosity, I'm sorry, luminosity is not on a negative scale. Um, the absolute magnitude is on a negative scale. Luminosity is on a positive scale, but they correlate. These lines are telling us the size. So these supergiants are a thousand times the solar diameter. So a thousand times the uh, diameter of our star. Um, these dwarfs are one one hundredth of our star. So they're our star divided by a hundred. Um, so the, this line here is the diameter of our star. So the main sequence goes from being about a tenth of our star to about 10 times our star. So stars are ruled by gravity. They are born in nebula or molecular clouds, and then gravity will collapse the cloud down and form a protostar. So the gravitational energy gets converted to thermal energy. This increases the temperature, and then we have that nuclear fusion beginning. In a main sequence um, star, we have gas pressure balances the gravity, so that stabilizes out the star. So basically, you have the stars trying to expand due to gas, but then the gravity is trying to pull it in, and it stabilizes it. Red giants, um, we have the um, hydrogen fuel is depleted. So we no longer have any thermal energy to counter gravity. I'm sorry, that just moved. That wasn't supposed to move. Um, and then uh, eventually we go from the red giants that we have burnout and death. So lower mass stars will become white dwarfs. Um, that happens in planetary nebulae. Higher mass stars become neutron stars or black holes, which are the supernovae where we get the very um, high mass elements are forming in those. And those require a lot of energy and they have a lot of gravitational pull. So this is another way of looking at the evolution of stars that we all, they all start out in this molecular cloud and they become a protostar. Depending on the mass, it can go through the main sequence um, and then never have any real fusion of helium um, to form a red giant, and those become the white dwarfs. It can also go through the main sequence, become a red giant through helium fusion, then fall into or become a planetary nebulae when the gravity collapses on it, to then become a white dwarf. Um, the white dwarf is where all of the outer parts of the star have been uh, lost. That we only really have the core left. So this is the fate of our star. Uh, it will go through this stage. High mass stars go through the main sequence. We can see that these are going to be blue and white and larger. They will become super giants instead of red giants. And then eventually they will become supernovae. And then they can either become a neutron star or a black hole, which are both very um, high density objects. So if we go back to the, the sequence, we can act, what we're actually seeing here when we're looking at these stars, we're seeing different stages of stars. So we have a few super giants that were you know, would have started off as a high mass, I'm sorry, went to the wrong spot. They would have started off as a high mass star to go into the supergiant. We see some just red giants. So these are mainline stars that have gone through the giant phase and then they will um, go after their main sequence, they go through a giant phase and eventually become planetary nebulae and then go will become white dwarfs. And then we see many white dwarfs that have, you know, gone through their lives. So after these um, stars have gone through their lives, we will have remnants. So white dwarfs are the remnants where we only have the outer layers, uh, or I'm sorry, all the outer layers have been ejected, so we only have the core. A white dwarf that has a mass equal to our sun would be about the size of the Earth. A white dwarf that has a mass 30% greater than the sun would be the size of the moon. 
So the more mass they have, the smaller they are, the more gravity has pulled them down. Um, so they become very dense. Neutron stars are smaller and more massive than white dwarfs, so they're even more dense. Um, they're very hot, but they don't have a lot of luminosity, so we can't see them very well. But we can detect them with pulsars, so this is when the new neutron stars emit a radio signal that pulsates, and that's why we call it a pulsar. So we can identify them by this signal that they emit. Stars can also become black holes. These are the densest objects in the universe. So basically the, the density of these objects is increasing as we go down this line. Black holes are so dense, nothing can escape them. Uh, the gravity is so great, nothing can escape them. Neutron masses three times, um, basically you need to have neutron masses three times the mass of the sun collapsing in order to form a black hole. Oftentimes, um, the way that we identify a black hole that is, again, nothing can escape a black hole, including light, they will have a giant companion star that's kind of caught in the gravitational pull, and we identify that star, and that's how we identify where the black hole is. The last part of uh, looking at beyond our solar system is looking at galaxies. So let's expand out from a solar system. So galaxies are collections of stars and matter. So basically you have a collection of solar systems and um, they will form a galaxy. There are different types. So we can have a spiral galaxy. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral. We can have elliptical galaxies um, that are more in the shape of an ellipse. We can have irregular galaxies that don't have a regular shape. And there are also dwarf galaxies, which are small galaxies. Galaxies can actually catch each other and merge, and those will then become clusters. Um, so we can see a cluster here. And then we can have superclusters, which are clusters of clusters. Um, so the universe is really vast, is what can be summed up on this, this slide. It's constantly expanding, too. So um, the universe is an amazing thing. Um, so I also want to remind you, make sure that you're studying up for the first exam, which will be next week. Uh, there will be no lab next week. We will have lecture on Wednesday instead. Um, so the exam will be on Monday. And um, I will see you in lab on Wednesday. Keep up on the reading and all the online assignments. And I hope you had a nice uh, Labor Day weekend.